Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Henriquez. I'm co-chair of Wombleban Dickinson's COVID-19 Task Force. We're excited to welcome you today to the second in our series of webinars on returning to work. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on environmental safety considerations. A few housekeeping items. Uh, first, you may have noticed there is a poll uh, that is available for you. We'd appreciate it if you would participate in that poll uh, by completing that uh, during the presentation, and then we're going to be reviewing that. That poll will close shortly. Um, also, there is a Q&A box. We do appreciate several of you for submitting questions in advance, uh, and we will be uh, going over those questions at the end of the webinar. But if additional questions come up as we're presenting, you're welcome to enter those into the Q&A box. Uh, we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the time that is allowed. Um, I'm excited to introduce today my partner, Brad DeVore. Um, Brad is a partner in the Charlotte office of Wombleban Dickinson with me. Uh, he is one of our environmental uh, partners and works with clients on a host of uh, environmental and safety issues. We also have a couple of consultants here today to provide some expertise as we talk about these environmental issues. We have uh, Brian Godfrey and Brett Cox, both from uh, TRC uh, companies. TRC companies is a tech-enabled consulting firm. Uh, they're a worldwide company with over 6,000 employees uh, providing uh, safety and environmental and engineering advice to a number of clients. They're going to be talking to us today to help us really understand some of the more scientific and technical aspects that go around the environmental safety considerations that we're going to be focusing on today. And I'm excited uh, to have them with us. Uh, Brian, Brad, Brett, thank you all for, for joining us today. You can do it. Glad, glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, before we jump in uh, to talk about these issues, I do want to remind our listeners that this is a part of an ongoing series of free webinars being offered by Womble Bond Dickinson. Some of you, I believe, attended the webinar we offered on May 1st, the Return to Work Liability Concerns. I was the moderator for that panel. That was recorded, and in fact, you can now watch that uh, or access a link to that on our website at Womble Bond Dickinson. We also had a webinar we recorded yesterday on employee privacy and company data in conjunction with the ACC. Uh, that's available, I believe, at the ACC site. That's the Association of Corporate Counsel. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing the final one in this Return to Work series. My partner, Richard Rainey, is going to be talking to us about specific employment considerations. And obviously, there's some overlap among those webinars, but that'll be dedicated to a lot of those issues on employment, returning employee leave questions, testing questions, and some of those. Uh, we also have one on May 7th looking at insurance issues um, and specifically around business interruption insurance and some of the analysis and litigation that's arisen there. We also recorded an interesting one on March 30th on supply chain disruptions. If you are dealing with supply chain disruptions, that too is recorded and available on our webinar, as well as over 50 different alerts on COVID-related topics. If you want to get those alerts and invites to future webinars, you can sign up for that um, at, our, at our webinar. We encourage you uh, to do that. So uh, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and jump in um, to the discussion. And I want to remind our listeners that part of the reason we're doing this now is states are beginning to reopen. Uh, here's a map of the United States that shows some of the reopening, the green states are reopening, and that's being updated all the time. A lot of folks that are listening are trying to figure out, you know, how to reopen if they're reopening. Um, let's go ahead and start uh, and talk a little bit about the science. And, and maybe, Brian, if you can lead us off and just tell us a little bit about some of the science around, uh, around this virus and, and what goes into some of the technical aspects of, of fighting it, maybe an introduction. Yeah, so the novel coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is, is what we'd refer to as an envelope virus, uh, or you may hear the term bilayer. Um, and, and with this virus, the reason that we consider it an envelope or a bilayer is because there's a, a lipid layer that surrounds uh, the DNA or the RNA of, of the virus itself. And, and that's very critical for us to understand uh, because that creates a, a weak spot uh, for this virus. Uh, you'll hear a lot of emphasis put on uh, cleaning and uh, washing your hands. And, and the reason that that's stressed so much is that uh, with that lipid layer, um, we are able to 
essentially render the virus somewhat ineffective or, or, least, or less effective uh, because uh, the soap and water breaks that lipid layer down, uh, which allows us to, to do a better job at handling it. So, that, so that's really critical that we understand that and I, you know, not getting too deep into the science, but because of that fact, uh, cleanliness is extremely important with, with this virus. Uh, the secondary part of that would be the disinfecting or sanitizing, but it starts with the soap and water. And, and it doesn't have to be an antibacterial soap um, because uh, this is a, a virus, it's not a bacterium. So with, with using just regular soap and water, we can do a lot of good for our places and for ourselves, controlling uh, this virus and the potential spread thereof. Let me ask you, Brian, let me ask you a little bit about um, transmission, um, because as we get into some of the more specific rules, you know, everyone's worried about how, do, how does this get transmitted and what can we do to stop it? Is this, and is this, you know, a brand new transmission mechanism or is this something that we've seen before with other viruses? What, what's the thinking in terms of, uh, in terms of stopping uh, transmission or at least trying to minimize? Yeah, so COVID-19, they, they refer to it as a novel coronavirus because it's the first time we've seen this exact one, but there are other SARS and MERS type viruses uh, that have been around uh, and, and seen since the early 2000s that are very similar. Um, and, and so the transmission is as we understand it right now, and, and we have to understand that, that there's still a lot of data being gathered. There's a lot of things being uh, analyzed and researched uh, but as we understand it right now, the, the transmission um, is uh, capable human to human, obviously. It, uh, coronavirus typically starts from an animal host uh, and then crosses over at some point to a human host. Um, and it's, it's aerosolized transmission that we're most concerned about. So through droplets, if we sneeze or we cough, so our saliva, uh, music exc mucus excretions and things like that that we're concerned about. So that's why it's extremely important that we're, we're following the guidelines that were being established by the CDC and the World Health Organization and others about containing our, our own coughs and sneezes and those types of things uh, so that we, we don't transmit that to another person. Let me ask you about masks and, and we're, we'll dig into this more. And I know we've already gotten some questions about masks. I guess a threshold question that I think some people are still asking is, does the mask protect the wearer or does it protect the other people around or both? I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the function of a mask and who are we protecting? So it's really going to depend on the type of mask to, to really you know, answer that completely. So if we think of it from the fact of a, a typical surgical mask or even a cloth mask, what we're doing is we're trying to reduce our uh, expressions of any kind of um, aerosolized particulates to uh, go to another person. Uh, so we're, we're trying to control that. If we're looking at an N95 or we're looking at uh, another type of powered air purifying respirator that some people may be familiar with or an air purifying respirator, um, those types of things are gonna not only protect the other person, but the, the wearer of that respirator as well. So a lot of it really depends on the type of mask, but at a minimum by wearing a mask, uh, whether it's uh, you know, a bandana or a cloth mask, we're reducing the spread of any of that aerosolized uh, item uh, to protect other folks uh, who may be susceptible to uh, or at risk to getting the virus. Gotcha. And, and beyond masks, are there other ways to mitigate aerosol transmission? Well, you know, the, the old cough into your elbow type thing, you know, uh, and sneeze into your elbow, those, those things, uh, we, we make fun of them sometimes, but they work because that's trying to reduce that spread. Um, social distancing, uh, because we know that in a cough or a sneeze, uh, those particles are going to only go so far. Um, you know, there are other variables that help to, to transmit that some, but by social distancing, we can reduce uh, that hazard. Um, and so those are the biggest things that we can do is, is being clean, social distancing, and utilizing the mask. That's great. Now, now I know there's also surface transmission, or at least I've read about potential surface transmission. Um, tell us about that. And Brett, feel free to jump in as well. Did you want to add on that one? 
Yeah, again, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a science that's uh, now totally well understood. Uh, again, it goes to the cleaning and disinfecting of the surfaces, the role of the soap and the detergent, again, with the lipid layer. And then after that, adding the disinfectant, I think that's some of the confusion is that just the disinfectant alone is effective. And it's the timing. It, we, I was on a discussion yesterday where if people haven't been around the surface for seven days, uh, it's basically a safe environment. But short of that, we don't know what services hold the virus longer than others. So Brian, I can, uh, you can fill in on that too, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Brian, the further thoughts on that. And, I, and we also have a question about face shields from Leanne, and I think that'd be good to talk about too, in particular, whether they are, how they're different from masks and how you may want to decide between a face shield. What? Yeah, one of, one of the thing to mention is uh, you'll go and you go into shopping centers and stuff now, and you'll go to various things, there's plastic barriers between folks. That's uh, an important uh, aspect in many work environments. We have close workstations, interactions with people. So those are a consideration of workspace as far as mitigating transmission between workers and uh, the customers and clients and what have you. Yeah, and, and in regards to the, the face shield, so the thing you have to consider is that the face shield does have a gap, uh, you know, that gives some space for things to leave. So. Um, it, it's going to reduce some of the transmission, some if you were sneezing or coughing or something like that, but it's, it's, it's not as effective as a mask that would sit closer to your face uh, and kind of trap those things in. Um, so we, we definitely recommend that as a useful tool, uh, but, you know, in any situation, it's all about training of the people to understand what the risks are associated with them and how to properly use the devices. Uh, as well as the understanding of uh, your risk and your hazards and evaluating those appropriately to ensure that you're utilizing the best item that you can. Um, you know, and going back to the, the, the cleaning of the surfaces, you know, Brett's absolutely right that it starts with the soap and water. Um, if you go straight to a disinfectant or sanitizer, you're not going to be as effective in cleaning that surface as if you start with the soap and water to break that lipid layer and get that down um, because as the, the microorganisms and other, you know, bacteria and things are on those surfaces, uh, they give food for viruses. Uh, so you, you want the, the area to be as clean uh, as it can be and then utilize the disinfectant or sanitizers uh, because those will be much more effective at that point taking care of the surface than a, a dirty surface when you're applying the disinfectant or the sanitizer. Brian, can you give our listeners an example of where you might want to use a face shield instead of a face mask? I realize that's going to be an individualized thing, but if they're trying to decide mask versus shield, what are, what are some of those considerations? So, so it really comes into play in the distance or the, the areas where people have to gather. Um, if you look and you're able to maintain a, a safe distance, whether it's that six feet or, or more um, apart, I think the face shields would be absolutely um, useful in those situations. So a, a situation where, um, you know, I, I'm still doing some traveling. So I checked into a hotel recently and they had a table set up uh, be, between me and the desk where the person normally stays. Um, you know, that type of distance, another person wearing a face shield could be appropriate. But if I'm, if I'm within a foot or two of somebody, then I would definitely recommend more of a mask uh, because there's a probability of some transmission there. That's helpful. Let's shift. I mean, I think the folks that are attending are thinking about reopening, thinking about how to reopening. Brad, I'd like to bring you into the into the conversation in terms of what folks need to begin thinking about around environmental safety, you know, and reopening. Can you give us an overview of some of those considerations? I know we're going to dig in uh, to some of our specific recommendations uh, in a bit, but let, let's let's go there. Sure. Um, the way I look at this, and I, I think about it from a, a litigation exposure kind of a scenario or perspective um, in three words, plan, execute, and so you need to have a plan, call it your response plan, call it your COVID plan, that is going to address and take into consideration the OSHA guidelines, federal and state, the uh, CDC guidelines, state, local, you know, municipal, uh, guidelines that may be applicable and organize around those on all aspects of what you're going to do to open up your space, 
was disinfected, and Brian can correct me in more detail on that uh, before people come in. And then what's your plan going to be with respect to folks? Are you going to require uh, testing or at least taking of temperature? Uh, are you going to require certain types of masks? Are you going to require gloves? How are you going to engage social distancing within the workplace? Um, and how are you going to enforce and document that as you proceed? So some companies are large enough, they have internal teams that can probably assemble much of that information, perhaps assistance of an outside uh, consultant. Others probably are going to be very dependent on an outside consultant um, to help them develop that plan, give advice as to how to do that. But you know, ultimately, uh, you're going to need to be able to document making what you put into the plan what you're going to require your employees to do how you're going to communicate it to them and how you are going to keep record of all of that because if there are infections notwithstanding all the best efforts uh, by the employer and the infection may not be uh, arising in the workplace but there's an infection regardless uh, and there's litigation that file that documentation is your best defense uh, going forward I think that's a general overview, Mark, of the, the way we're thinking about it from the legal perspective. Thanks, Brad. I think that's helpful, and that's certainly something we've heard at other webinars as well. Is that you know that documentation on that thought process is really is really an important consideration. Um, and there is you know there's litigation out there. I know uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has indicated they're tracking over 300 cases right now, uh, claiming some kind of violation against businesses for some. COVID exposure. So this is not a hypothetical risk. It's happening now. As you may know, there's discussion right now on Capitol Hill about whether there's going to be protection for employers as part of a new stimulus package. And at least uh, Mitch McConnell's indicated he won't pass anything unless there's some level of either immunity or a safe harbor. Uh, we'll try to keep you folks alerted to whether that happens and what it looks like. Uh, but that's in part because there's already been a bunch of lawsuits filed. You heard about some of those at Friday's webinar. Um, there. So I do think documentation is key. Brian, going back to you, we, we've talked, Brad mentioned the need to have a detailed response plan. Um, what's the role of someone like TRC or another consultant? I, I know you guys are great. There's obviously other folks too, but uh, you know, share with our listeners kind of what the consultant's role is in connection with that plan and what that planning process is like, because this is not something uh, a lot of our listeners have gone through before. Right. Yeah. So from, from TRC perspective, there's a couple of different areas and levels that we can get involved in. Um, you know, what the company needs to determine is, is they need to follow, uh, first off, the, the understanding that as a business under the OSHAC, you know, we're required to, to provide a healthful and safe work environment. And so it, the plan all starts off with a good risk and hazard analysis to determine what um, you really need to do. Um, hopefully you have somebody internally that can do those types of evaluations, but that's something that a, a good consultant could assist you with. Um, you know, a, a consultant whose understanding of uh, health and safety regulations and requirements and rules that are out there. Um, and once you determine the, the risks uh, and the hazards that you have, and you start looking at the, the configuration of your business operations, where your folks are gonna have to be, uh, the proximity they have to be to each other, um, determine kind of where those high touch and low touch points are, uh, where the, the funnels end up being that people have to pass close proximity to one another and you can't adequately social distance or, or keep people away. Um, you utilize that to start developing more of your documentation of, of uh, operational procedures and expectations. Um, and as Brad alluded to it, documenting it is extremely important because you can utilize that as uh, a resource for training. You can use that for a resource later on in any litigation issues. Uh, so the documentation of it is important. And again, that's something TRC could assist with uh, or, or any consultant who would be familiar with the rules and regulations. And then beyond that, it's establishing how you're going to maintain that uh, environment as safe and health uh, oriented as you can, uh, creating a cleaning process. Uh, that's documented, uh, evaluating a contractor who could come in to do the cleaning and disinfecting and sanitizing, um, and even going and involving an industrial hygienist. I um, mean, that's one of the big things that we're, we're seeing recommended and TRC is recommending that you involve a, a, an IH professional 
to help you determine what is the best cleaning process, the best sanitizer or disinfectant to use, um, and creating that work plan so that um, you can then test it to make sure that you're doing it adequately and, and the, and the, the uh, manufacturer's instructions for that particular sanitizer or whatever it could be uh, is, is being used correctly. Uh, and then that way you're able to ensure that your process works. So there's a verification step there as well. Brett and, and Brian, I, in terms of nitty gritty, um, who is actually responsible typically within the company? Is this an HR function? Is it legal? Is it operations? I mean, who, who are you dealing with? Because again, this is something a lot of people haven't dealt with. And I think one of the questions is, you know, who, who, who's the person that's going to figure all this stuff out in terms of where people are coming and how we're going to modify it? What's been your experience so far and the folks you've been working with to get reopened in, in terms of, you know, where that responsibility is? I'll start because mine has been a bit briefer, I think, than Brian's uh, thus far. But I think <laughs> it's actually, uh, it's a combination, for example, I think, uh, a COVID task force within the organization would be a good way to go. You have elements of legal, you know, HR operations all involved so that you can develop the plan and then you can seamlessly execute. So all, you know, during that process, that may be folks in the organization you, know, you have, or you might be going to some outside vendors, be they legal, you know, or technical in addition to that. So that's, that's the approach that I've seen uh, clients take because they want to cover the waterfront uh, within the organization. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Brad. I mean, we, we've seen so far in our experiences yeah. in the of, you know, a single person inside of an organization trying to manage everything. Um, but our recommendation is definitely that you have a point person who can maintain uh, a good flow of information, uh, you know, getting information from trusted resources uh, to keep what's going on and then look toward it being a collaborative effort between internal and external resources because uh, there's elements of in the place so your human resource professionals should be involved uh, looking to your health and safety and environmental folks inside of your organization uh, looking at those industrial hygienists because um, it's, it's got to be a collaborative team effort to make this successful because there's too many moving parts and, and too much information to be absorbed that, that one person cannot be successful in, in getting this done. You know, the one area where we've seen best practices and lessons learned is with the cleaning contractors and the staff, you know, the, the ones that work in the hospitals and different places are used to working in this type of environment. Those that work in manufacturing, you know, have to kind of be brought up to speed, brought in as part of the team, and they have to understand, you know, the, 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 the serious stuff in this and how this would proceed and changes their job, right? So that was one of the things we've seen is where the clean contractors and people that have been hired really don't understand why it's being done and therefore don't do it well. I think that's a great, um, you know, I think that's a great point. And I do think we've got, you know, I'm, I, we just closed our poll so some of you can look at it. I know we have, you know, a, a number of manufacturing folks on the on the line. All right, let's talk for a minute about the manufacturing companies in particular. What are some of the things that folks in that industry, you know, need to really focus on from an environmental perspective? Yeah. So again, it goes back to evaluating those high and low touch points. You know, where are your folks going to be, and what can you do to to keep them protected? Um, and I can't stress that enough that that it, you've got to evaluate your environment. Um, and in the manufacturing environment, you know, we're, we're fast paced, we're quick moving, we're in close proximity a lot of times. There's a lot of um, uh, potential hands-on activities that take place depending on what you're manufacturing. Uh, so that's where you really have to kind of drill down and look at um, those hazards, those touch points, uh, and, and utilizing personal protective equipment uh, that's not only from a standpoint of protecting the employee from the hazards of the workplace like we would normally envision, but also considering PPE now as a way to protect your end consumer from something that, that takes place. You know, we're seeing those same questions come up in the food industry and restaurant industry about how do we, we do that. Uh, so now we have to really take and start looking at personal protective equipment as not only a, a tool to protect me as the wearer, 
but also the, the person who's on the other side now consuming my product. I think that's, no, I think that's good advice. Um, in looking at the survey results too, we've got, uh, I think 11 folks on the line in the education area. And obviously that's a complicated area because you've got students, you've got issues around dorms, dining halls, large lecture classrooms, sporting events. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunity for social interaction. And many would argue that's a, an essential part of a college education uh, is not <laughs> distancing, but being close with other folks. Uh, um, and so I know that's a huge challenge that, that education folks are, are working on. What, what kind of, do you, any of you have advice for some of our education clients and other listeners that are struggling with this whole issue of how do we offer that education? You know, and obviously they're doing it remote right now in many instances, right, which, which addresses it. But once you get people back on campus, are there some specific things they can think about from a safety standpoint uh, that makes sense as an educational institution? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, it, it's going to, it's going to re-standardize our classroom sizes and configurations, um, at least for a time period. Um, I, I think we're going to end up seeing the need for um, a, a cleaning process to be done more often um, for those environments where we, we can't always socially distance and we can't keep people from touching surfaces. Uh, so there's a lot of industries that will fall into that same uh, arena, uh, not just education. Uh, but I think that, you know, our educators are brilliant folks. They have uh, adapted to this very quickly uh, and, and have figured out ways to keep our students engaged and, learning and moving through the process. Um, I, I think as we learn more about this virus and how it interacts and reacts, um, you know, there'll be better guidance that comes forth from it. But I think in the interim, it, it really draws our mind to looking at how we set up those classrooms how we have people coming in. Can we stagger um, times for people to be coming in and out of classrooms or buildings and give a little more time in between those um, scheduled class changes? Uh, you know, instead of you fitting in five or six classes a day, you may only fit in three. Um, you know, so it's, it's really going to change the way we have to think about it for a short term. Um, and and uh, there'll be some growing pains. But I, I think that we just have to keep in mind that it's always about evaluating the risk. Uh, and, and doing everything we can to, to educate uh, the folks on what we're up against and, and how to appropriately react to it. I think the other thing that comes into, thing that comes into play is, uh, there's a, we're talking with parents about this, is not saying, you know, not sending your kid to school when they have symptoms. Or if you're in college, this is easier for college students. If you feel like you have something, don't go to class, right? Lower that threshold quite a bit more and be cognizant of that decision-making. I would add that and there's two pieces of what Brian and Brett were both talking about that we need to keep in mind. And that is things are changing in terms of information um, and a feedback. So uh, they're gonna continue to change probably for the foreseeable future as we learn more and more about the virus and how to address it. So that standard of care, if you will, is gonna keep shifting. So another part of a plan, executing it is going to be keeping yourself abreast of those changes, um, integrating them into a plan going forward. Um, the other, I've seen some of our manufacturing clients, um, some upon one infection, shut down an entire plant for two weeks of quarantine. Others will have an infection, they'll disinfect a certain area. And so there's variability in how the manufacturing space at least the information I have, there's variability on how you address even the infection or the report. And I would also say, once you've cleaned it and disinfected it, um, somebody's going to come along at some point and touch it and possibly reinfect it, you know, a surface area. So you're going to you're going to have to have some sort of routine. You know, there's going to be increased frequency um, of cleaning, and disinfecting than probably has been the case before. That's great. And, and I want to turn from some of the industry specific stuff to the kind of the actual cleaning plan, cleaning space, because I know you've got some suggestions on uh, on those things. Um, I, you know, this is another one we, we submitted a polling question on, and I think it's very interesting, you know, to look at the response. You've got 
16 of the responders say they clean their own facility, so they've got their own uh, cleaning folks. Um, 34, about half of our respondents, uh, say that they actually um, contract out for cleaning. So they have folks come in from the outside and do that cleaning. And another 14 have landlords that handle uh, that cleaning for them. Uh, so you've really got a mix of responsibility. And before we get into the recommendations, I guess the I'm interested from all three of you, if you have thoughts on, you know, if for those that are cleaning themselves, should they keep doing it? Should they consider contracting out? And for those that are contracting it out, what are some of the things to look for or think about uh, in connection with those contracts? Brian, yeah. How you start, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so from, from a standpoint of um, looking at if you're doing it your own self or if you're contracting it out, um, first and foremost, you need to make sure you're using the appropriate uh, product and you're using it uh, appropriately so that it's effective. Uh, so EPA has an end list of items and, and Brad, you probably can speak more to that. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we have those appropriate items uh, and are using them the right way. Um, you know, again, as we discussed, soap and water is going to go a long way. Um, using a sanitizer or a disinfectant is going to help to prolong the, the quote unquote cleanliness of the surface. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would recommend that if you're using an outside contractor, you evaluate their procedure, um, look at what they're doing, uh, look at the product they're using. Are they allowing that product to be uh, in contact with the surface the appropriate amount of time based on the manufacturer's information? Because uh, some require a, a one to two minute contact time. Some may be shorter, some may be longer. Uh, I've seen where a lot of folks are fogging or aerosolizing uh, products and some products are not designed for that. So we need to really dig into what we're using and how we're using to ensure that it's being done correctly. Brad, Brad, uh, Brian mentioned an end list. Is this the letter N? I mean, what what is what is the end list, and how do I? I, I don't think I can go into my uh, my local Walmart and say I'm looking for endless cleaners. So how do how do I you know what 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 does it mean? How do I do that? Sure. Well, the end list is uh, an EPA generated list. They have what they call the emerging emerging pathogen uh, website. But if you uh, you can get on, you can Google the EPA emerging pathogen uh, website, and you can search it by the EPA registration number for a product. Um, it's it's usually a disinfecting agent that is you know which is has been registered with EPA. The idea is that that disinfectant included on the end list has been found to be effective against a virus like COVID-19, not necessarily been tested as effective against COVID-19, yet a, a similar sort of enveloped virus as uh, Brian described earlier. And so then it's, it's approved and listed there. So you can look it up, you know, if you have an outside contractor that you're gonna utilize, uh, determine whether their disinfectant has been included on the end list and is being, at least EPA believes, being effective. Um, and it's pretty user friendly. Even lawyers can do it. So it's an <laughs> wow. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the other thing, you know, if you decided to use an outside uh, vendor, you know, to, uh, to do the cleaning and disinfection, um, allocation of liability in the contract. Um, you know, are you going to require them to at least seek some sort of insurance you know, to protect against uh, you know, violations of it? What will the standard of care be, you know, for, for them? So very typical contract issues you know, would have to be taken into account as you begin to do that. Um, so it's worth, you know, probably involving somebody as knowledgeable from the legal side, whether in, you know, inside your organization or outside, to take a look at those issues. And what I would ask is maybe if Brian could talk a little bit about ATP testing. I've, I've, I've learned about it and I've been kind of fascinated by it, you know, and how it works that I think the audience might be interested in as well. 
They might be. And, and define it for us, too, because I know there are a lot of initials out. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, what yeah, so a ATP testing, and then you can tell us about how it's used. Yeah, so <laughs> ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So every living organism has ATP, and, and uh, some of us may recall from some of our science classes in high school and college that uh, ATP uh, is a source of energy for um, living organisms. Uh, and, and I won't get into the ATP cycle because that's uh, well beyond what we need to be talking about today. But uh, just basically understanding that every, every organism has ATP, uh, when we clean a surface, um, we can do a pretest and we can do a post test. Uh, and so we swab the area. And by swabbing the area, we are able to put the swab into a luminometer or luminometer, however you want, wherever you're from, you want to pronounce it differently. Um, but this uh, will basically send light through the, that tube with the swab, and it will give us a reading in relative light units or RLUs of how much ATP is present. Now, this does not confirm the presence or lack of presence of a uh, virus or any, any organism like that. But what it does tell us is how effective our cleaning process is and how likely we are to have the presence of something negative on that surface. So if we do a test before and we have uh, you know, a reading of 100 RLU, and we, we clean and then we uh, test again and we see that we are down to uh, 80 or 70 or whatever it might be, we're showing that we're making a change or a difference. Uh, and there are standards established by the food industry and by the healthcare industry um, because they use this ATP testing a lot to determine the sanitation of their contact surfaces like in surgical suites or clean labs or uh, food preparation areas. Um, so there are numbers that are established that tell us that if we're within a certain range, then we are likely clean enough to be safe. And, and so that's what we've been understanding is if we can go in and clean these surfaces, uh, you know, have the contractor go in, do the cleaning, do the disinfecting, and you do this ATP test, um, not only one, are you determining that your cleaning process is working to clean the surface, but you can have a good sense that we're being effective in removal of, of the potential virus that might be there. I think that's really interesting. And so so these are tests that have been around for a while. This is not a COVID-19 specific test, but it gives an indication of whether the surface has been cleaned enough in general for in terms of, you know, micro, microbial life or other stuff to say, yep, looks like it's clean. And so the assumption is if you've cleaned it well enough in terms, you've got a low enough RLU rating uh, in general, the assumption is you've also cleaned off the COVID uh, virus. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's been around for a very long time. It's very effective. It's, it's very reliable. Um, so, so there are a lot of industries that already utilize it. And so this is just a good methodology that, that you know, a good uh, industrial hygienist uh, can come in and, and do that test to um, not only confirm how it's working, but then can help you develop those procedures for going forward so you know that the process is effective in, your, in, in cleaning and protecting your employees. That's great. Let me ask Brian and Brett, I mean, we've talked a lot about surfaces. Do, do our listeners need to also worry about broader systems like your HVAC, mechanical uh, stuff? Are there, are there other things in addition to, I guess, what I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, the desktops or the counter or the conference room table or the break room? Are there other, you know, systems they may need to think about, particularly if this is their first reopening after a while? We've talked to HVAC HVA experts within TRC. We brought them in on this topic. And it actually, you know, there's some benefits, like if you can increase airflow, uh, that helps. But uh, each HVAC system, each type of environment, uh, operating environment is a completely kind of a different scenario. So you'd actually have to have somebody look at it specifically. It's very hard to offer a generic answer. But it is, especially if you haven't uh, cleaned or attended to your system in quite some time, uh, it's well, well worth doing. And there are certain types of systems that if they've been off for a month or so, and you're going to restart them, there's considerations that you have to be careful of just in restarting them. So again, that's where uh, specific technical uh, expertise and advice is needed. 
let's shift gears for a minute because uh, and we, we may come back to some of the other clean protocols, but we got some questions ahead of time and, and we've gotten a lot of questions, particularly around dealing with those employees that come back and some of the uh, employee issues. Let me say we've covered some of those on Friday. We'll have an employee employment law specific uh, webinar uh, coming up on the 13th. But in terms of safety stuff, what are some things that people should be thinking about with employees in particular? You know, what, what do we need to communicate with employees about in, in terms of those safety considerations? Yeah, I'll I mean, I'll to, to Brad to get more to the legal stuff, obviously, but but coming from you know, uh, an, an OSHA standpoint, health and safety, you know, OSHA is putting out some really good guidelines for us. But the, the one thing we have to remember that, that isn't a guideline, it's a shall, is that, that I mentioned before, that as an employer, you know, we're required to provide that healthful and, and safe environment for our employees. Um, so I, I think, you know, from the standpoint of what we're recommending is that number one, that you're establishing well-written guidelines internally of what your expectations are. Um, and, and doing that on a, on a risk-based, hazard analysis-based type situation. Uh, and training the, the folks to understand uh, the risk associated, just like you would with, with any process that you change inside of your facility. You know, whether it's a manufacturing or whatever facility it is, uh, if you change something, you conduct the training and you have understanding. Um, and and then, then beyond that, I think it's evaluating the use of the personal protective equipment establishing those guidelines of social distancing, um, you know, communicating with folks and letting them know if they have symptoms, uh, like Brad alluded to earlier, that, that uh, you know, of a cold and flu, uh, that they, you know, the norm is for people just to come to work feeling a little sick. Um, I think we need to encourage them at this point to have the, the discussion of, of not coming and, and trying to establish, you know, whether or not it's actually, uh, you know, a sinus issue or it's uh, wonderful, uh, you know, I'm in the South, so, uh, you know, this, we're just coming out of that pollen type of year where everybody was confused as to what they had. Um, so those types of things are important for us to have those discussions and be open and communicate effectively about it. I would, I would agree with Brian that communication is going to be the key if anything, you want to over communicate, um, you know, to because you're one of the things you're going to have to do is build a level of trust with the employees, you know, that you actually have a plan and you're implementing it and they're being well educated about it. And then there's going to be an enforcement component of all that. And that's going to be different across, you know, different companies and their culture. But on this issue, if you are imposing social distancing, you know, you're going to have to enforce it. You're imposing the use of PPE in some manner. I would suggest to you you have to enforce it because if you don't, and you've set this policy in place, uh, and then there's an infection, also or arguably as a consequence, you know that that exposes you. you know, from my perspective, to some you know, to potential litigation. Um, so I I would agree. You know, having all that information uh, pulled together and then educating your workforce would be. Um, also, are you going to have as part of the written plan? Um, you know, what if somebody is reporting infection to you? How, how is that information going to be handled? You know, that's more for the next webinar, I think, and you know the, the kind of interface or tension between HIPAA you know, and informing other employees and how that's going to happen. It's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed, and you have to come up with your own policy up front how you're going to do it. Um, but I'll defer to that webinar, you know, for the details about that. But one thing to think about if you're going to require even temperature readings or some sort of testing of employees, that's something you want a third party out to a medical you know, person. And it may be an RN, somebody like that. It doesn't need to be a MD necessarily, but um, you know, because of those tensions and because of privacy issues, et cetera, something's going to have to be worked out in your plan on that. Thanks, Brad. One of the questions that Ryan had asked uh, earlier on our Q&A, and again, I encourage folks, if you've got questions, go ahead and, and submit them because we're going to try to leave a little time at the end for them, was if the employer says you have to have a face mask or a face shield, like we talked about earlier as a safety measure, is the employer required to provide those? Or can the employer say, you've got to wear a face mask 
you know, bring it, bring it with you or where, you know, wear one that you made at home or bought at home. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think from, from, and I'll let Brian talk about, you know, the technical side of it. But I think if you're imposing a requirement, if they, if those, if that PPE, let's say the mask is readily available and it can be purchased, that's one thing. If it's not, you know, then I think it, it just, in a sense, shifts to the employer try to you know to be able to supply that it's 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 kind of a practical answer to a complex question but i think as ppe becomes more and more available you know employers may be able to shift some of that to the employee to be responsible i think in the short term if there's short supply um you're hard pressed to say you must have this if they can't get it on their own so again that's kind of a practical answer to a complex question yeah, I, I agree with Brad. There's not an easy answer for that at this point because, you know, um, you know, right now under under OSHA, we, we've got some guidelines, but, you know, how is that mask being considered? Is it is it um, a required personal protective equipment for the safety of the person wearing it uh, versus the safety of the, the other person you're coming in contact with? I think we're going to have to wait a little bit to to have some understanding from um, the federal side a little bit to, to really make a, a better decision on how we would mandate and cover that. Because, um, you know, as we know, under, you know, the OSHA rule that, you know, certain PPE is, is deemed required to be supplied by the employer and some is, is deemed that it's, op it's not required by the employer. Um, so we, we kind of have to see where this is going to fall. I don't think we really have enough knowledge at this point to really answer that effectively. And, and just to remind listeners, right, so, you know, there may be some jobs where you have to wear a steel-toed boot, right? That's, a, that's something that is not uh, typically an employer-required or a tip employee or required device, in part because those boots are going to be different for every employee, right? So it's a little hard to say, here's your standard-issued steel-toed boot. Other stuff like hard hats, we at least traditionally see employers often providing, you know, hard hats and, and other equipment. I think this is challenging. Here, you know, face masks, obviously some are more custom fitted than others, but a lot are more generic. I, I you know, I, I'm with both of you. I think if we're gonna say it's essential that you wear one, we think it's to be safe, you have to wear, you know, the mask. I, I think it's difficult to make that determination and then say, you've got to figure out a way to get it, right? You have to have a mask, you have to show up and it's up to you to find one in this environment, that's a challenge. So I, I, you know, I think what we are seeing is most employers doing it. Now, some are saying we encourage you to, you know, provide your mask, but they have some supply available for people that say I can't find it or I didn't, you know, I left it at home today or some other provision so that you have a source of those. And that can be a real problem for folks with a lot of employees that are looking to open up because uh, as everyone knows, these masks are not easy to find. But I, I do, I think that's a good question. And Ryan, other thoughts around PPE? I mean, we focused on the mask, we talked a little bit about face shields. What about things like gowns and gloves? Are, are people, you know, using those in workplaces? When would those be appropriate? What are some of the things to think about in those? Well, the one thing I, that I want to, you know, bring to light there with, with the use of the, the gloves and gowns and things is that those are coming in contact with potentially contaminated areas and surfaces. So anything you then touch with those items becomes contaminated. Uh, so we have to understand that, uh, you know, exerting universal precautions like are expressed, you know, under the OSHA standards, where when you have a pair of gloves on, uh, those gloves now become contaminated and they need to be handled appropriately. And, and, and anything you touch with those gloves, yes, you're protecting yourself, but you're, you're cross-contaminating potentially other surfaces. Um, so we just need to keep in mind that uh, the PPE is there to provide some protective layers for us. Um, but it can still create cross-contamination and issues for other folks we come in contact with. So we need to handle them appropriately, dispose of it appropriately. You know, it's not like it's uh, infectious waste necessarily, like a hospital might have or hazardous waste, uh, but it still needs to be taken care of appropriately and utilized the correct way. Um, you know, if you're wearing a mask, it's designed to, to go over the nose and mouth. Um, you know, so, we, we, want to, we want to use the items the way they're intended uh, and, and to be sure that we're then following back up with, you know, if we're wearing gloves, we take them off, we still wash our hands after we take the gloves off. Uh, you know, if we've been wearing a mask, 
we still want to wash our face, you know, because we've been trapping inside that mask. So there's still the precautions, even though we, I guess the thing is, I don't want someone to have a false sense of security because they're wearing a mask or they're wearing gloves. Uh, we need to still understand that contamination and cross contamination can still still take place. I think that's a helpful. I think that's helpful advice. One thing we've gotten some questions about are what about commuting? We have employers that have uh, folks that you know take the bus in, take the subway, um, you know, and is that something to worry about? Do you want to restrict folks from using mass transit on the idea it's more dangerous, or say they've got to wear a mask and during you know in mass transit, although that may or may not protect them depending on whether other people are wearing masks. Um, and again, some localities are requiring masks in some situations, others are recommending it. A any thoughts as they think about those kind of issues in terms of what their employees may be exposed to outside of the workplace, but that can create dangers for them? Yeah, I don't think we want to collectively say don't use mass transit, uh, but I do think there's still that air of caution that needs to be expressed of socially distancing, you know, utilizing the, the facial coverings uh, mask as you can in those areas because, you know, maybe a little more difficult. Those are confined areas. Um, you know, the great thing is a lot of the mass transit uh, organizations are taking steps to uh, employ uh, extra folks to, to clean. Uh, we have seen as TRC a lot of um, areas utilizing the ATP testing and having the, the work plans developed for the cleaning process. Uh, so I think everyone is of the mindset that we have to do all we can to protect each other. Um, I, I just I would still employ the same common sense approach that, you know, we have to do what we can do to to be there and that be socially distancing and, and using the PPE appropriately to protect ourselves and others. That's great. I do want to shift to some. We've gotten some great questions in, so I want to make sure we get to some of those. Sharon asked, you know, how if we provide individuals with wipes or masks or gloves, does that increase our liability? How much responsibility can those folks take on? Do we do we incur responsibility if we provide tools that either aren't used or you know there are issues there? Brad, what are your thoughts in terms of you know providing PPE and liability on that? Do you have employees sign waivers saying, you know, I, I understand I'm going to be given this mask, but it's not going to save me from all infection. What what do we do to limit liability in those circumstances? Well, I think it's twofold, Mark, and, and one is the, the communication uh, process of uh, with the employees of your plan and where you would make it clear to them uh, that, yes, this is intended to, to enhance protection, but it is not a guarantee of protection. That would be the, the one piece, and that would be written materials, you know, uh, videos, things of that nature, you know, on a regular basis. Because you know, you're also going to have new employees coming into the into the workspace, so it's a continuing thing. The other is what I alluded to earlier is enforcement. You know, you, you give somebody the gloves, you give somebody the mask, but you're also telling them that you have to use it within the workspace. So when you if you become aware that they're not how are you going to you know, discipline the employee uh, with respect to that to make sure that you're enforcing uh, that requirement? I think so. Merely supplying the uh, supplying the uh, PPE is one thing. I think that's a positive thing. Um, it's the enforcement, the education, and the enforcement parts of it that are going to be important um, in order to have it have the effect, the desired effect, take hold. And that's going to be difficult. You're always going to have some employees that is just, I, I don't want to use the mask. You know, and, um, and, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm going to defer to the next webinars to, you know, what level of discipline and, you know, how do you address that from an employment law perspective? But I, I think that would be kind of the practical aspect of it. You know, if you set that policy, you better be enforcing it. Good. Another question we got uh, from Liz is for folks that have a residential component, let's say it's an education uh, facility with dorms, um, you know, can residents be safely housed in a dorm? Are there things, how, how do you, how do you address that from a safety standpoint? Are there things in a residential setting uh, that need to be done trying to minimize exposure? Suggestions there? Brian, Brett in particular? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, it's going to go back to the, the same basic premise of cleanliness, um, you know, and, you know, we all know college dorms are not always the uh, most uh, 
best well kept environments um, in some regards. Uh, so it's going to be important that again we're communicating, we're educating, we're providing guidance uh, for folks to understand that you know. And if it's a if it's you know thinking of dorms like an apartment where maybe there's one or two people in there and they've got the room to keep you know separate and and not um, be too confined. Uh, and ventilation is appropriate, things like that. I think we're at a reduced issue, but we still need to enforce or, or encourage the, the cleanliness and, and monitoring of those types of situations to the well-being of those folks as much as we can. Yeah, I'll offer a little insight. I, I, a little insight too. I think when you get to the like, I was a resident advisor in a dorm for four years while I went to grad school and such. There's going to be whole new uh, education for people who are resident advisors and stuff in dorms too, about how to observe the students. You know, again, whether it's cleanliness, whether they're sick, how to communicate, how to get the students to go to their proper health care. You know, those types of things when they should perhaps go home. But those people in those dorms, in many cases, are going to be the front line. Gotcha. Leanne had a question. She understands that there's been some advice to wait 24 hours after learning about a COVID-19 exposure before doing the cleaning. And she asked, you know, why are you doing that? Are you waiting for the virus to settle? What, what's the purpose of that waiting period? Can, are, you, are you familiar with that, that waiting period? I, um, I, yeah. I, I have not heard that. Brett, have you or Brad? I, I have not heard for, the set, for that yet. I, I, you know, the, the guidance that I'm seeing through the AIHA and other organizations is that, you know, you, you, have, you know, you're constantly evaluating. And when you hear of a potential infection, in the area that you're starting the contract uh, contact tracing and and starting to develop a, an idea of where uh, this person could have been and the surfaces they were in contact with and the people they were in contact with um, but I, I definitely can look at that and see if there's some some other further recommendation to get back to, to them on um, I know we won't get to all the questions but another one that uh, I think April had submitted ahead of time was what about kitchen safety the high touch items like a coffee pot handle or service items? Are there ways to to change that? How how often do you clean that? Do you do you get rid of things like a coffee pot? Go to individual things? What you know? And any thoughts on ways to maybe modify uh, protocols in the kitchen to to reduce exposure? Is that something you guys have looked at? Yeah. So the AIHA, uh, the Industrial Hygiene Association, has put out uh, some guidance for restaurants, uh, and and some of the things they're recommending is that. Um, you know, we're using single use items so that we can dispose of those uh, that, you know, if it's not that we are utilizing the higher temperature and the, the soap and water, um, you know, aspect of cleaning it thoroughly and then sanitizing, which most restaurants follow anyway. Uh, so there's contact surfaces that we're just doing a little more diligence on and wiping them down. But the AIHA does have a great document uh, for, for that as well as a good resource. And, and Brad, another question we got ahead of time from Kim was, we're making a lot of recommendations here. Are these mandatory or these guidelines? You know, what, what, what do they have to do versus what they should do? Can you just touch on that? I know, and I know almost out of time, but I think a lot of people are wondering, wait a minute, you know, you were flooding us with, with information and ideas and hiring consultants and doing all this. How much do we have to do? You know, what, 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 you know, what, what is, you know, what's the legal status of these recommendations? I, I think it, for the most part, these are OSHA and the CDC have come out with guidelines. But there is a general duty clause. And again, I don't want to absorb the next webinar, but there's a, a general duty clause under OSHA. that if you have a known hazard, you need to address it. I think that's going to, for the moment, be the legal underpinning. Or if you reopen your business, you have an obligation to provide a safe work environment in accordance with, with that general duty clause. Uh, so our our thought collectively, TRC and, and Womble Bond Dickinson is, if you've made the decision to, to do that, these are some of the things that you should be putting into place in order to meet that standard and also to defend yourself against potential negligence-based claims in the future. Um, and we've talked a lot about employees, but part of the plan needs to address visitors, customers, Know, other people that are going to come into your space. Um, and so that would also be part of the plan. What are you going to require from them? I've seen some of the questions. What are you going to require people to attest to? You know what I mean? That they're not sick. They're kind of, 
So those would also be protocols that would be developed, you know, for visitors, customers, you know, people coming into your workspace. Um, so th that's what I think, but that one or the, the more detail on the employment law and the OSHA would be in the third seminar, but I submit to you that would be the, that would be the general duty clause would be the, the legal requirement. Brett and Brian, we're almost out of time, but any final thoughts or remarks on that or any other concluding stuff? I see our time is just about elapsed, but I didn't know if there's something else you wanted to add in before we wrap up. I mean, from my standpoint, it's just, you know, due diligence. Just do what you need to do to ensure the safety and well-being of your folks. You know, get together a very good, well-documented plan uh, of approach. Uh, establish your team. Uh, for COVID response so that you uh, have the decision makers and the, the expertise to make the decisions and, and ultimately, uh, you know, try and focus on getting uh, up to date information from reliable sources uh, so that, you know, because this is ever evolving, ever changing. There's data coming out day by day, sometimes hour by hour. Uh, so it's important just to stay abreast of what's going on and, and, and look to resources like, like you guys to, to be able to gather information. Uh, and stay on top of what we need to do that's in the best interest of our, our employees. Great. Well, thank you. I, I, Brett, any any final uh, final words of wisdom well, before we wrap up? You know, I think, you know, one of the things we get wrapped around the science and stuff, that you, we go back, a lot of the stuff that we're doing here is common to many other industries. So again, whether it was food or whether it was hospitals, and, and Brian, we were actually talking about working at a brewery, doing all these types of things. So you can have confidence that what's being done here from the, when you're talking about ATP testing and all that, other industries have been doing it for a long time. So, uh, you know, be comfortable with that. That's great. That's great advice. I, I appreciate it. I know there's some more questions both submitted ahead and a few we didn't get to here. Several are on testing. We will be talking more about employee testing, how to do it, what to require, do it at home, elsewhere uh, on May 13th with Richard Rainey. So I will try to address those there. Um, this recording will is being recorded. Uh, the webinar is recorded and it will show up on our website. Uh, so it takes a couple days, uh, but I'd expect two or three days from now, you can go and watch the YouTube of it or, or send your friends there. Um, we do thank you for attending this second in our three-part webinar series. Uh, again, there's more information available on our website. We appreciate your time today uh, and hope you have a terrific rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Mark, Brad, before we yeah. leave, yes, just Brad. one additional TRC. Um, there will be access to a TRC slide deck with some of the more technical information in it, and we'll make that available on the website as well. Excellent. No, that's a good reminder. Uh, so you'll want to check that out for a lot of the technical stuff. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this webinar. Thank you. Have a terrific afternoon. Thank you, Brad, Brian, Brett. Uh, terrific discussion on, on a lot of important issues. So we appreciate it very much. Thank you.